central Texas, the Brazos River winds its way through a city of over 100,000, leading us to the oldest institution of higher education in Texas. The river's full name is Brazos de Dios, the arms of God. The city is Waco, and the institution is Baylor University. David and Mary Malone are helping their daughter Joella move out of their home and into Collins Hall. As we were walking across the campus, she said, uh, Dad, this just feels right. Um, you can get a good education at a lot of schools, but the relationships that you make at Baylor are for lifetime. Mary and I have uh, friends both in student body and in the faculty that we have stayed up with for the last 25 years. I'm excited for her because of that. The relationships that you make at Baylor are what makes Baylor special. Welcome to Baylor. I'm going to miss her energy and her excitement most. Yeah. Probably, I mean, I don't have any fears leaving her at Baylor. Um, and in, fact, <laughs> in fact, I'm, I'm so excited for her. I mean, this is a, such a special part of her life. We think okay. it is time for her to go out on her own. Ready, set, go. Bye, Daddy. Love you, too. Thanks. Yeah, have fun. Okay. Thank you. 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 Joella is about to join 3,000 other nervous incoming freshmen. The highs and lows they share over the next four years will mark one of the most significant journeys of their lives. Over the next few days, hundreds of sophomores, juniors, and seniors will make sure that the first experiences at Baylor are positive and inclusive. No one should feel like an outsider. President Robert Sloan takes Welcome Week seriously. Welcome to Baylor. We are really glad you are here. You're part of a wonderful new family. Take advantage of the moments. Learn all you can learn. You're in for some of the greatest days of your life. We're glad that you're a Baylor Bear. It's homecoming week, and it's Tuesday night. KOT is preparing for Thursday night's pigskin performance. America's largest homecoming parade and celebration is put on entirely by students. It demands discipline and dedication, but it's also great fun. Fun is a rich part of college life. I want the students to have fun. I want them, you know, I'm like any parent. I want my kids to have fun. I want them to be safe, you know, so uh, I want them to grow in character. I, I want them to face problems and work through those problems. So that's part of college life. And even during homecoming week, the business of learning goes on. With over 150 undergraduate programs to choose from, Baylor develops mind, body, and spirit through arts and sciences. Professor Alden Smith teaches Latin. Body from sleep, and he rouses his friends. Exactly right. The fire that stirs about her when she stirs burns but more clearly. It's a powerful poem, really. Professor Ann Miller believes in the power of literature to enlarge our aspirations and connect us with one another. It's a quiet gesture, but if she'd just turn her head, you, you could see her face and you would know that little shadows and threads of gray. Since Baylor was chartered in 1845 by the Republic of Texas, its mission has always been the same 
prepare students for service and leadership by integrating academic excellence and Christian commitment in a nurturing community. To that end, Baylor brings outstanding guest speakers like Bill Moyers to campus. I take this to mean creation is not finished. Life on earth is in complete, dynamic, continuously in renewal. Genesis is just the beginning. The millennium is not the end. What happens now to creation is up to us, every one of us, you and me. Thank you. World leaders to speak at Baylor include Desmond Tutu, Margaret Thatcher, Colin Powell, and Presidents Reagan and Carter. Okay. International leadership often depends on languages other than English. The foreign language labs use satellite broadcasts and the internet to make study relevant for our changing world. We have drawn uh, faculty with outstanding academic credentials from all of the named schools across the world and across the nation. It's teaching, it's relationships with the students. That's what people want to give themselves to. The language labs aren't the only aspects of Baylor undergoing transformation. Most alumni would not recognize the Penland Hall cafeteria. However, what hasn't changed is the fact that more than 90% of all freshmen live on campus. John and Chris are two graduating seniors who met as freshmen. Well, I lived in Penland Dormitory on the fourth floor, and uh, I just found that I met a lot of people there who shared a lot of common interests with me. They were also interested in academics and uh, number one to be doctors or lawyers. You know, we all had sort of similar ambitions and aspirations. And I was reading a book on my bed and he didn't even introduce himself, didn't even ask my name. He said, is that a good book? And instantly we had a, a foundation of conversation. On Penland's first floor, David and Brady share another common concern. I went to skiing and I I kind of like this girl. I bought her this, like, this little ski hat. It was like a little mouse hat. It was really funny. And uh, I gave it to her, like, and like the next day, she just, see ya. <laughs> so, yeah, the buying thing did not work. On Lake Waco, Professor Owen Lynn teaches stewardship of our Earth's resources. These people have all had several years of education in ecology. Now we're focusing that ecology toward water and toward water problems and uh, just see how far we can push them. Now the light climate is fundamentally a ratio. Lynn's students are part of an international water quality study conducted by Harvard, the University of Texas, and Baylor. This education I'm getting, I want to use it, and that's, that's the most important thing to me, that, that I can use it and make a difference in this earth because it's so important to me. Professor Max Schock and his students provide air quality sampling for the state of Texas. We do basically two things. We are involved in sampling the air. We look at transport and diffusion of pollutants with a sampling aircraft, but at the same time, while we're trying to understand pollution, we're developing solutions to the pollution problem, and that is by developing biomass fuels. Students from Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Mexico, Australia, all over the world come here to study aviation sciences. And some, like Sergio, come from South Texas. I'm from San Benito, Texas. I was a migrant worker, and my father kept getting angry at me because I would stand up and look at these Air Force airplanes that would fly over these fields. And I told my father that one of these days, I would like to learn how to fly. Some of the companies that we work with have offered me jobs and I got offered an internship at NASA, and it's changed my life. At night, performance halls feature lectures, live music, and drama. Tonight's performance of Falstaff is a joint production of the theater department and School of Music. Tonight, you and the rest For Lance, the annual mass meeting is a time to pass on Baylor's tradition and spirit. 
mass meeting for freshmen, it's a very solemn time. It's a time to reflect on Baylor's past, but more specifically, that's a time when the sophomores, juniors, and seniors at Baylor hand the torch down to the freshmen and holding that torch, I mean, that seems like something very menial, but it means so much to you as a freshman when you come in to be able to have that responsibility. You're now the bearers of this tradition. Kappa Sig and Chi Omega have won top honors in the homecoming parade for the last two years. They're working hard and hoping for a three-peat. That is, if they can come together and finish in time. There's probably close to 200 people that are uh, associated with this float. You learn delegation, that you can't do everything, and that sometimes you got to be able to tell somebody to do something, and a lot of times they'll do it better than you would have done it. It's about how to be a leader without bossing people around. Every day our float gets better and better, and it makes me feel better about how we're going to do. We've won it the past two years, but it's not expected. Uh, we've put a lot of hard work into it, yes, but we've also had so much fun doing, you know, just the different things. And actually, Yeah, we want to win. Yeah, <laughs> we, we think we want to win. In the Hankamer School of Business, Professor John Martin challenges his MBA students to go online and practice their entrepreneurial skills. Uh, your assignment for today is to analyze the purchase of a controlling interest in Yahoo. Graduate education at major universities like Baylor has to do with the transformation of young people into adults who have careers. And I strongly believe that the future of this university and most great universities lies in our ability to prepare people for professional careers, whether it be in engineering or in business or in law or in the clergy. If you think about the people who are community leaders, they're people who are in the professions. They're teachers, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're business leaders. And I think all of these things point toward our increased involvement in graduate professional education. Over 1,500 students study in Baylor's graduate and professional schools. To find out Baylor's law exactly school was founded in 1849 and is ranked as a tier one law school. From the latch all 400 students take range. part in moot court. You found that distance to be 34 inches. Right. In addition to law and business, Baylor is becoming known for its School of Engineering and Computer Sciences and for the George W. Truett Theological Seminary. It's noon, and over barbecue, talk often turns to sports. Athletics is the window through which many people will view Baylor University. And athletics, while it can be a form of idolatry, and it can be too obsessive, it also has great uh, qualities. It has the quality of, of competition, of discipline, of community. Our young people come here first and foremost to get an education. We want them to come here and be enriched by the values uh, of this place, and we want them to have success, of course. Baylor's grown to more than 13,000 students, but the faculty continues to focus on the individual. I had a wonderful set of young men three years ago. They were in the honors program. They wanted to maintain a very close relationship till the day they graduated. But one of them had the money to go abroad to study in Maastricht. And one of them did not. And it was a dividing point that broke my heart. One deserved it as much as the other. This technology is... Oh, but, but there's something no similar, though, in yeah. all these issues. For example, technology. If technology contributes to the interaction between teacher and student, that's one thing. If technology stands as a barrier between mm -hmm. the two, then we've got the same sort of problem. See, I get a computer. We must find a way to establish a, a scholarship fund so that a student, if he performs well, can be guaranteed an international experience of at least a semester. It would be a dream of mine for every student to have that opportunity to study abroad. Because you, you learn other people, you experience other ways of living, you develop uh, a sense of other patterns of thinking and other ways of relating. So I, I wish every one of our students could have a study abroad experience. This year, Kappa Sig and Chi Omega have the honored position of being the final float in the homecoming parade. The only problem is the parade starts 17 miles from where their float is being built. Friday night, about 1 o'clock, we'll begin to start moving it downtown. We have to be at the parade site between 3 and 5, so 
it's just a process of uh, cars blocking intersections because this thing doesn't stop for red lights. <laughs> so we're just having fun during the parade. All the stressful stuff's over by then. Meanwhile, other students are preparing for Friday night's bonfire, and the faculty discussion continues. Professor Bob Packard has taught Packard physics to thousands of students over the years. I experiment almost continuously. Every semester I say, I'm going to retire when I learn how to teach, but when I see the final grades, I know I failed again, so I'll try <laughs> next. I think what I most want from my students is for them really to be thoughtful decision makers in the face of ambiguity and uncertainty. I'm not necessarily just just a German teacher, that I can interact, for instance, with seven other professors who are not in my field, and that we can bounce ideas off each other and we can give our own passions in, in that kind of setting to the students is, is, a, is a wonderful new idea. Well, that's and been a I'm, major change yeah. in my teaching in the last few years is this involvement in interdisciplinary teaching. Yes. One of the thoughts that occurred to me is, when students leave Baylor, the decisions they make are always going to be interdisciplinary decisions. Hi, Sean. Here's this collection from Brazil. And there the University Scholars Program encourages inquisitive students to design their own curricula. Good luck. Thank you very much. I found out about this University Scholars Program, which allows you to pick and choose the courses you want to take that you think will best fit where you want to be. You know, in that I want to be pre-med. I took a lot of science classes, yes, because I had to, but I also took a lot of philosophy and English and history because I think all that's really important in the medical field as well. The way I got into it was freshman year, I wrote a letter to the committee saying that because of these considerations, my future career goals and aspirations, that I think it would be better if I could step out of the, the box that most majors are designed in. Whenever I get to pick up the course catalog book, being a University Scholars major, I have made the comparison to being a little girl walking into a candy store. I get so excited, I flip through and just think of all the dreams and possibilities I could go to. And I have taken some phenomenal courses. That, I think, is, is one of the best parts about it, though, is you have to make those hard choices. I'm a second semester senior right now, and I look at my friends who are younger, and I'm saying, man, you've got to take that class. And that's what college is, I think. It's kind of the pursuit of general education, that extension of, of knowledge that we all need for life skills. <laughs> One reason Baylor students look forward to homecoming week is that they know they'll get at least one good meal while parents are in town. The warehouse district downtown has been converted to Restaurant Row. It's just a short walk from the old bridge. And now it's time for Thursday night's pigskin review. Stage, the homecoming queen nominees prepare for the big announcement. University scholar Abigail knows she won't be crowned. They, they will be get to ride in a carriage in the parade, and they will be put on a pedestal for the rest of their years, known as the Baylor homecoming, what, 89th annual homecoming queen. Right here, right here, right here. Why can't we be like you? The 1998 Homecoming Queen, representing the Mortar Board, Abigail Feaster. Well, there were, I believe, 61 nominees, and so needless to say, I didn't think that my chances of being crowned were even a remote possibility. So many wonderful people I was in the room with, and we all had such a good time just going through the process. So we went on stage, and then when they did crown me, I, I did cause quite a reaction, because um, I was just really surprised. And I found the whole thing rather humorous, because they give you such an antiquated 
Well, they give you a, a, a cane and, a, and the big cape, and it's about oh, 15 feet long, and it drags. And so I just found the whole situation very flattering, and I was very honored, but it was also, um, I saw the humor in it. It's Friday morning, and Billy and his friends have been up since Wednesday. My job as guardian of the flame is to protect it. If somebody comes to blow it out, we uh, risk life and limb protecting it. We guard it until the bonfire, which is going to be here on the Fountain Mall. And uh, it's been pretty much blown out every time except for like two years ago, I think. And so we've got history going against us right now, but we're vigilant. You know, when I came to Baylor as an undergraduate, Baylor played a remarkable role in stimulating me to think in new and different ways. I mean, I think if somebody comes here and lives with us for a while, they will see that while religion is taken seriously, we are a university. And that means that we have to take the critical spirit seriously. Baylor's PBS station gives Baylor a new opportunity to serve Central Texas. It also provides Professor Michael Corpy with a valuable teaching tool. Baylor's one of the only private universities to have a PBS station. It's also unusual for any university to truly integrate the professionals at the station with the academic program and the students. What we're trying to turn out, or what we're looking toward, is uh, 15 years to 20 years down the road. You know, we want to get our students a good entry-level position, but that's not the goal. And so we want them to be in 15 to 20 years in some leadership, policy-making, creative position. And we want them to have something worthwhile to say. Walk down that lonesome road all by yourself. All the extracurricular activities, stepping out and involvement in the churches and uh, involvement in the clubs, the fraternities, sing, homecoming, all of those activities uh, are part of the total mix. It is the curriculum of life. Keep going. Is shining high. Is shining high. Shining high. Above the trees. Baylor students also serve as bear trainers, run the Bear Downs bicycle race and sponsor the spring event, Dia del Oso, Day of the Bear. One of the things that we like to say is Baylor is one of the largest leadership labs in the world. I mean, all of the traditions of Baylor are um, focused on students who are leading. Dia del Oso is a day of fun where all the students get off um, to just enjoy themselves right before final. And classes are released, and there's tournaments, there's activities, there's entertainment, there are booths, um, you name it, it's like a fair just for uh, Baylor students. Roxanne is the first female president of the Baylor Chamber of Commerce. I've learned that I can work with many different people to, to um, put together an idea and make it into a big event. The result of the students' involvement is a sense of community, the Baylor family. That's what prompts over 25,000 alumni to return to the Baylor campus every year. They bring their kids, renew old friendships, and sometimes just remember those who are no longer with us. Baylor alumni love Baylor University. When Baylor alums uh, come back, they want to see one another. They want to see friends, and uh, they love to go back and see the professors. So I think for, for our alums, it's, it's like a family reunion. Now, it must be admitted, not all reunions are held in fancy surroundings.
One of the things Baylor does well is provide every student with an opportunity to lead and to be involved. driving out and leaving the warehouse, and our car just started making these popping noises, and I was like, oh no, we're, we're in a world of hurt here. So we pushed it here, and it kept doing the popping noise, and then it just died, our battery went dead. We're just asking for it, I guess, building something this big. <coughs> Tough luck. Good morning and welcome to the 89th Annual Baylor Homecoming Parade. Thanks for joining us. I'm Laura Martin. And I'm Gordon Collier. It is a beautiful day here on the Baylor campus. Maybe I'm exaggerating just a little bit. It's uh, a little bit chilly out here. We, have we may just have like two or three people look out. Let's hook it up and see if we can push it. Let's do it, man. I mean, we've come this far. What do we have to lose now? Nothing at all. We don't have a car anymore. <laughs> you know, is that going to work? <laughs> So you're going to push the whole flow with the guys? Yeah, so not me, drive. I'm driving. <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> I'm talking, so I don't have to push. There she is. And this is the lady, the young lady earlier. of the hour, the 1998 homecoming queen, Abigail Feaster. She's going to have to do the pushing. There's, there's a hole right there you can film the There's one of them. They're all the way back. Steve. Yeah, New American Steer. Okay. Make sure you can hit the brakes. Ready? Hey, New American, you got that green truck? Clutch power! And the president's car getting detained there by well wishers and a speed bump. A speed bump always uh, plays speed a part of the parade. <laughs> It gets tricky when uh, the floats start coming over those. Hey, we're making progress right now. We got a low tire now. So we're just kind of taking it as it comes. We don't know. But those guys, I think, are doing all right. Let's check in with Mike Barger to see what in the world's going on down on the street level. Mike. This is a uh, wildcat in the hat. Oh, look at that. It's real time. These turns are going to be pretty tight, so uh, we're going to have to get it pretty exact to keep the momentum going and go over the speed bump, so that's what it's really going to see if we can do it. Good, our guys are kind of getting a little winded in there. You can see one of them through there. We took up some Gatorade and everything. They're dying. They're ready to get this thing over with. We're dragging a little over that bump. Hopefully not a rip. Freshman Leadership Organization nominee. It's, I don't know, she's having a good time. We have another big winner coming down the street. Class A winner. Bit. That last float that we saw, Night of the you know what's moving that float? What is people? A bunch of people. <laughs> the car broke down, so there's like 10 people underneath that float pushing it the length of the parade route. Bless their hearts. Yeah, like 15 feet, friend, 15 feet. Whoa, break, break, break. Rock and roll. Right. We're proud. We're here. 
That's awesome, man. Awesome. That's a lot better than having a car. Yeah, <laughs> generator <laughs> went off. Okay. That's just to be real. Interference on our walkie-talkies. I mean, I mean, it was a definite, it was a definite patience. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> Then all too quickly, much like our college days, homecoming week is over. It's not just the classroom. Though the classroom is important, it's all those relationships and uh, you come back to a place to rekindle those memories, those feelings, to see the people again. And it's, all of that is owing to the, to the great experience they had, uh, you know, when they were here as students. It's a great journey. And I'm convinced the college days really are, in many ways, the, the greatest days of, of life and learning and living. That's what they tell us uh, in retrospect. Baylor has been so much more than a place you go to school for a couple hours a day. I've made personal and lifelong friends with professors that have changed my life, and I've found the closest thing to a calling that I guess you can find at the ripe age of 21, whether it be the Foreign Service or international law, human rights concerns, it's something to where you get to actually help somebody. I've been accepted at Duke University Law School and University of California at Berkeley. NYU and Michigan and Georgetown and UT, so even if I don't get anywhere else, I've got some very good options. In the last 10 year period studied, the school that led the nation in the number of their undergraduates who went on to receive doctorates in the professional schools it was not Harvard, it was not Yale, it was not Brown, it was not Princeton or Notre Dame, it was Baylor University. And I think it goes back to our personality. Our students have a kind of service orientation. They want to make a difference. Some say the Armstrong Browning Library reflects the soul of Baylor. And when the chamber singers perform amid the priceless treasures of Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, there is reason to believe that God's in his heaven and all is right with the world.
I think higher education is best done when it is done from a set of core convictions that touch the human soul most deeply. And I am persuaded that we can be faithful to a Christian worldview and that we can be the finest intellectually enriching place that can possibly be imagined. I think we can touch the minds and hearts and spirits of students in a way that is really almost unparalleled.
I remember being told the first time I came on campus that now you're going to have people tell you hello, and uh, and people will will speak to you, people that are complete strangers, and it's still true. You can walk across this campus, you can see somebody coming, and uh, you know faces just light up. Uh, it's it's part of the part of the environment, and uh, faculty student uh, relationships. Uh, those are still, I think, the hallmark of, uh, of what, what happens here academically. And the students tell you that, too. They, uh, they continue to tell us that, that uh, the relationships with the professors, that is so central to what happens. You think of a life of service. You think of a life of love. You think of humility. And humility is important not just for an individual ethic, but it's important as an academic ethic. Always always being willing to to say I don't know always being willing to to say um, that that others may well be right and I may well be wrong always being open to the truth um, a scientist has to have humility and I think I think that's exemplified in the cross a, a historian has to have humility to learn, to be, to be open to the way things are. I mean, how many great discoveries have been missed because someone either said or thought, well, I know that can't be true or that couldn't happen. And uh, I think it's very important for Christians to be open to the truth and to be willing to, th to think new thoughts. Um, so that the cross, I think, I think points to humility. But I, I am persuaded that we can be faithful to Jesus Christ that we can be faithful to a Christian worldview and that we can be the finest intellectually enriching place that, that can possibly be imagined. I think we can, we can touch the minds and hearts and spirits of students in a way that is really almost unparalleled. And uh, that's what I want us to do. I see, some, I see some commonalities still in Baylor students. Uh, one is that uh, there seems to be a service orientation. Another is uh, that they seem to have uh, good people skills. Again, these are generalizations, but they seem to have a good people skills. They seem to have a strong work ethic. And they seem to have an interest in what I would call, well, you could, you could call it a spiritual interest, but that seems a little bit too limiting in some ways. It's what I, I don't know how to describe it, but a sense of vocation about life, that life is meaningful and they want to do something with their lives. It, it, it's not just ambition, but it's beyond that. It's a sense of vocation or calling, that they want, they want their lives to count for something, and that's, that's, that's pretty exciting. We attempt to provide an education that's very holistic. And that, that, in a sense, begins with our Christian heritage and Christian identity because we, we want to touch the whole of life. Well, that means, again, as I was saying earlier, the, the, the disciplines. Those, those are only artificial distinctions. And so, uh, yeah, we used to refer to people who had a broad sense of, of learning as Renaissance people. What you have now um, is often referred to as problem-solving abilities and people skills. It really doesn't matter what you do in life. You, you'll never know all the facts about that given area. It will always expand. Knowledge is just exploding. Technology makes uh, everything uh, obsolete. Uh, it seems like sometimes in a matter of months. And so what you have to impart is, yes, a familiarity with a given discipline because you have to learn the vocabulary, the jargon. You have to be able to move a little bit within a, a knowledge framework. But a student has to be able to connect the dots. A student has to do problem solving. You have to, you have, to have people skills. You have to have leadership ability. You have to, you have to know how to, how to respond to an ever-changing environment. So an education... If, if it were only gathering facts, if that's all an education um, should be, then a person should just stay at home and get a computer terminal and sit there and collect the facts. 
the people you meet. It's the relationships you build. It's, it's how to work through problems, whether it's a cranky roommate or a difficult professor or meeting the love of your life. Or, or, or making the best friends that you'll ever have, or, 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 or dealing with, with, with personal tragedy back home, or, or in, internal struggles about, about your calling and what you'll do. All of those things get compressed into the college years. And that's why I think it's very important for students to be closely related to a campus. In the last 10-year period studied, uh, the school that led the nation in the number of their undergraduates, not the percentage, but the sheer number of their undergraduates who went on to receive doctorates in the professional schools, it was not Harvard, was not Yale, was not Brown, was not Princeton or Notre Dame, it was Baylor University. It's, uh, it's really an amazing statistic. And I think it, again, it shows, it goes back to our personality. Our students have a kind of service orientation they have a sense of calling about life. They want to make a difference. I wish every Baylor student could have a study abroad experience. That's, you know, I went to Princeton. Well, after that experience in another culture with, you know, different, different setting, I knew that uh, I had to go overseas. And so Sue and I lived in England for a year. We went to, we then moved to, uh, I went to the University of Basel. We lived just across the border. Uh, in Germany, actually, and then I commuted across the border every day to the University of Basel in Switzerland. And uh, that experience uh, was uh, truly uh, transforming because you, you learn other people, you, you experience other ways of living, you, you develop uh, a sense of, of, of other patterns of thinking and other ways of relating, and it's, it's incredibly value, valuable. And then, of course, you just see sights. You see things. And it makes history come alive. It's the easiest way to learn another language. It's the easiest way to learn history. Um, and, and that's just to be there. And the stories come alive. Uh, so I, I wish every one of our students could have a study abroad experience. We really focus on that here. We were recently ranked in the top 10 among doctoral granting institutions in America uh, in terms of study abroad programs. And that's kind of surprising to some people, but we have an outstanding um, uh, program of, of study abroad, uh, in terms of, of studying abroad, and we're now beginning to get recognition uh, for that. We're, we're ranked uh, as a great, uh, one of the great academic values in America. There are various scales that are published by U.S. News and World Report, and um, I, it, on, on the so-called value scale, which basically measures what a student gets for what he or she pays. And in terms of academic reputation received compared to the cost of tuition, we're one of the finest uh, academic values uh, in America. So we're, we're proud of that. It was a transforming experience. Great memories are created. Those memory, as you know, is associated with places, with rocks and sticks and trees and buildings and people. And so uh, great friendships, life-transforming experiences, these sidewalks, these buildings, you come back to a place to rekindle those memories, those feelings, to see the people again. Uh, that, that's why people come back. And it's, all of that is owing to the, to the great experience they had uh, you know, when they were here as students, great traditions. Uh. I had an employer in Austin tell me that when you get a Baylor graduate, you get someone who has great people skills, you get someone who has a strong work ethic, you get someone who is honest, and um, you get someone who is uh, is service oriented, and that's uh, that's a pretty good uh, pretty good testimony for the for the Baylor grad. I'd like for freshmen to know that they are embarking upon a journey that probably will prove to be the most significant and influential days of, of their lives. They will meet people, professors, students. Um, uh, friends, um, they'll meet people that will forever change their lives. They will have experiences of reading, of talking, of laughing, of crying. They'll be challenged about what they believe and what they think. They'll be challenged uh, to, uh, to, to do things they've never done before. 
they'll they'll face they'll face in a sense all the problems of life but they'll be compressed and they'll be sudden uh, and they'll be at this dramatic changing point in life it, it really is it's a it's a great journey and uh, I'm convinced the college days really are in many ways the, the greatest days of, of life and learning and living and uh, that's that's what our students uh, I, I think that's what they find that's that's what they that's what they tell us uh, in retrospect I think that when you stick the word Christian in front of scholarship, people immediately begin to think, just as you've suggested, that there are boundaries on what is appropriate and what's inappropriate scholarship. I think what we came out of that meeting with was the notion that uh, all truth is God's truth, that there's, there, there aren't boundaries. Uh, but in order to maintain that, to, to actually accomplish this, this wonderful opportunity we have at a Christian institution to sort of take advantage of what we are as individuals and how that can expand what the institution can be, I think is demands our vigilance every day such that the, our, our mission doesn't stand in the way of truth but in, instead creates the environment where we can seek it. I think it's really crucial at Baylor that we preserve what has been the heritage at Baylor, and that is to take religion very seriously, but at the same time, we are a university, and that means that we have to take the critical spirit seriously. And it seems to me that Baylor's real task is somehow to combine the taking of religion seriously with also encouraging our students to be willing to critically assess all of their basic assumptions, and that certainly includes their religious assumptions. I would want my, my students to, to leave my classroom wanting to be lifelong learners and also realizing that learning does not necessarily have to take place in the environment of a classroom, that learning can be with one or two other people, and learning can be by yourself and your, your curiosity, your desire to, to read more, to know more about a certain subject, your desire to discover more. And there's an excitement to it. It is it's an excitement, I think, that keeps you young. No matter what your body ages through, your, your mind is always there and you can always use it to keep you young and curious. Well, I'd like for them to be able to think and to solve problems because we can't anticipate the changes and the problems. But I want also an underlying sense of value. They bring it mostly here and they go away with a stronger sense, I think. So I want them to be able to think past um, my particular subject, to be able to solve problems. I tell them, everything you study is important. You will use it. Don't treat it as something that you have to be told it's important. Just recognize that every day you're in a historical setting and every day you're in an economic and social and science. In other words, even if you deny it's important, you live in a scientific age. But to be a happy person, you must have a passion for living. I agree with everyone. Have a critical view, but not critical that's uh, finding fault, but critical meaning what did they not say uh, what other things should I look for, and then be willing to accept that questions are not always have answers, and that always to be, however, living life expectantly that the day might come when suddenly the answer will come. Don't be a sucker. See what you want to in a movie, but ask yourself, is that right? When you hear a speech from a politician or a sermon, or a lecture from me. How do I know that's true? Baylor has given me the opportunity to really get back a passion that I've had for a long time but had to uh, suppress. Um, I now uh, teach in the Baylor Interdisciplinary Core in World Cultures too, And uh, there, I don't, I'm not necessarily just, just a German teacher. Yeah? I can teach uh, all the aspects of culture that, uh, that I need to um, to help the students get excited and, and, and understand culture uh, on a global scale. And that's wonderful for me because I've always 
tended towards interdisciplinary thinking. And I used to be more or less pressed into a mold. You're a German teacher, you have to teach this. And suddenly, uh, I'm seeing that my, the way my mind works interdisciplinary, um, outside the lines, is, is coming into vogue, and I'm really excited about it. One of the thoughts that occurred to me is, when, when students leave Baylor, the decisions they make are always going to be interdisciplinary decisions. Mm -hmm. And, and one thing I've discovered in these interdisciplinary courses is this possibility of engaging in conversation and really modeling for students what it means to make decisions that draw from so many fields and that appeal to so many texts, so many great books that enable people to be better decision makers. I would encourage a student to do, and it builds on practically everything that's been said here, is to build yourself a good library. Put classics in it, by all means. Get the fine literature of the past, the core, the canon, call it what you want to. Maybe you don't believe there is a canon. I try to tell my students there is. And no matter where you go from there, if your library is with you, you, you have a rich storehouse. <laughs>
Yeah, did you look, uh, well, uh, so you see where you have your class number? Like, oh, I guess it would be 99. Right behind the 99 are the four columns representing that original stone structure. In 1940, Pat Neff dedicated what was known, became known as Pat Neff Hall. And the four Corinthian columns, in a sense, on the front of that building, replicate the four columns of the original stone building from Independence. You'll have to cut out a lot of this stuff, cut, cut out all the scandals. In 1899, Oscar Cooper was elected president of Baylor by the Board of Trustees. And there was great joy throughout the land because Oscar Cooper was considered to be academic, great prestige, uh, had been one of the founders of the University of Texas, widely known nationally, and Baylor had caught on to him. He, um, he was a, oh, I don't know how to describe his looks. I wasn't there in 1902 or in 1899, right? I mean, he had these little glasses on, a little mustache here, sort of Hitler-like. And um, he loved to speak in chapel. Chapel in those days was on the third, now look, this is how small Baylor was, in a little auditorium on the third floor of Old Main. And every day, chapel day, was, chapel was about an hour and a half. He would walk up the wooden steps to the second floor and then to the top floor, the third floor of Old Main. And the students, having already assembled, would stand up for the president. Very dutiful. And he walked in one day, it was in the springtime, it was a hot day. Um, the back of the chapel, uh, the back of the stage or platform, the three windows were open because it was a hot day and didn't have air conditioning in those days. He walks in, there is uh, the lectern podium, and he, he, is, he, he, he was the type of person, everything had to be just right, including himself. And he could not be distracted from anything. And enclosed within the podium business, the lectern, he heard the whimpering of what obviously was a little dog. And <laughs> what he did, he was very calm. <laughs> he lifted up the lectern, put it on the floor, and there was this sh little shivering black dog. And this president of Baylor took this pitiful little dog, turned his back to the students, threw it out the middle window to the, to the cement on the ground floor. It didn't die immediately, it howled in pain. And I had a great aunt who was in a student at the time, and she told me this story. And old people are tend, tend to exaggerate sometimes, but sometimes they tell the truth, and I think she did. Because you hear various variations, but I've got it from the horse's mouth. The students, unprecedented, stood up and walked out of chapel. And a short time thereafter, the Board of Trustees met and said to um, Oscar Cooper, perhaps he would be happier some other place. In 1902, he was succeeded by Samuel Palmer Brooks. So, a little black dog gave its life so that perhaps Baylor's greatest president would ascend the throne. It's strange how things work out. <laughs> That's not on the ring. In 1902, Samuel Palmer Brooks became president of Baylor University, one of the most beloved uh, presidents Baylor has ever had the longest presidency in Baylor history, 1902 to 1931. In 1909, he called the first homecoming. And he decided that Baylor, from what the students suggested to him, should have a mascot. And he was first and last a student's president. He listened to the students. We want a mascot. 
And students being students got into violent arguments about what should be the mascot or grasshopper or buffalo or something. But fortunately, they settled on a bear in 1914. But it wasn't until 1917 that the first live mascot came to Baylor. It was given by some army men who had been located at Camp MacArthur. And they're the ones who donated the first bear to Baylor. And you see the bear on the ring, young men and women? It's at the foot of your class number. His paw, his right paw, <laughs> is on the bell. I don't know, you know, when you get old, you think of the past and how good the days were. And, oh, poo, they're going to be great, too, in the future, I do believe. I'm passionately fond of this old school. It's my life, really. I was only 26 when I started teaching. <laughs> now you can figure out how old I am. Um, um, I'm passionate about this school. Uh, I love it beyond the telling of it. It's great. Great place. I could not imagine what I would have done had I not. Had the chairman of the Department of History not invited me when I was a student up at Brown University to come and teach for three years, or two or three years. Then in that two or three year period, he died. And the new chairman said to me, Mr. Reed, how long did Dr. Guitard say you should stay here? And I said, oh, indefinitely. That's my little secret. And I'm the better for it, not Baylor, but I am. <laughs> When we decided that new technologies was going to be our leverage point, our strategy, uh, we knew that we could participate in the industry. We could, we could be on the committees that dealt with the newest communication technologies. All we had to do was volunteer as faculty members. And we did. And we got in there. And the key to that is, those are industry people. Those are the people from New York, the engineers, the, the uh, management people at the networks, at the studios. And so we participated and helped and worked on these committees. Well, then we have contacts with major corporations, Sony and Panasonic and Avid and Kodak and Panavision. And then when we call them, they know who we are. They're, they're open to taking our student interns in positions at their companies. They're also very open to our suggestions and questions about their technologies. In 1987, we first took students to the National Association of Broadcasters Convention. It's a, a big technical and management show and a big equipment exposition of the latest cameras and all equipment. Well, we'd been active on the high definition television uh, committees and from those contacts, we were asked if we could provide students who would help with the engineering part of the show and helping to, sh to display the high definition equipment uh, and explain it to visitors, things like that. We took um, three students the first year and then every year after that, that grew to now, this year, we'll take 46 students to work at the show for various manufacturers and, and uh, organizations. Well, this year, uh, 40 students will work for Sony. We have uh, four working for the Pro MPEG Forum, which is an industry association. Uh, we have about a half a dozen working for the NAB itself, running the engineering conference. So it's quite an opportunity for them. Now, no other school does this at all. There are, there are, no other schools are involved in doing internships this way, and especially at the National Association of Broadcasters. Sony in particular, uh, we have so many Baylor students at Sony that other Sony executives have asked and inquired about this and said, well, you know, I, I went to Princeton or I went to Stanford or I, I went here. How, let's get some interns from, from there. And, and they were told no. Absolutely not. We need the Baylor students. They know how to do this. They understand this. You're not going to find that anywhere else. Well, our internship program, I think, is the key to our, the success of our graduates. In the communication field, you don't send out your resume and get hired. No one comes to campus and, and sets up interviews uh, for communication graduates. In the communication field, it's all word of mouth and who knows of a reliable person to hire. 
So if, if the students don't already have an uncle, you know, working at the studios or something, we have to find a way to create those contacts. And again, that's the whole point of the new technology and making contacts in the industry. And then we want to make those contacts and send those students to the places where they're likely to work. And I mean New York and Los Angeles, Chicago and Houston. We've had students on the Rosie O'Donnell show, on the, the David Letterman show. On, on Letterman, after we had the first Baylor intern on Letterman, and we've had several, uh, the next semester they called and they said, we didn't have a Baylor intern this time. We had one, and we really liked that Baylor intern. Could you please have Baylor people apply? Because they're much better than what we get locally. So uh, that's, that's the kind of thing. CNN in Atlanta, CNN in Washington, editing houses and production companies in Washington, DC. Washington's a very good place for internships. One of the strengths of a liberal arts education, yes, you have your major. But that's only about one-fourth of your time. Three-fourths of your time you're spent getting this broad-based uh, education. And many, many other of your peers, student peers, are taking other majors. They may be in the art department. They may be in psychology. They may be in music. They may be in information systems or in computers. And what we find is that those things overlap with communication. It's, we haven't separated things out into little boxes. So for example, uh, students in the music school might uh, write music to score for uh, student video production. We have uh, students in the theater department who, who take classes in directing actors for the camera, which is very different from what they would do directing actors for theater. Our students go over there to take those classes. Their students come over here to take filmmaking classes. We have uh, students from the English department come over here to take film, uh, film writing and teleplay writing. They have uh, creative writing and commercial writing classes in English that our students take. We uh, computer science, uh, uh, 3D animation and special effects. We have many majors now that either minor in computer science or they're computer science majors and they minor in telecommunication. I mean, special effects and 3D animation is one of the hottest uh, things going now. Well, one of the things about Baylor is, is its Baptist faith and, and heritage. So at the same time we were choosing new technologies as our overall strategy, we knew that we would always have a strong core of students who would be interested in communication and a very close relationship to their Christianity, some kind of action in the world that made a difference. Uh, and Baylor has thousands of alumni who are involved in those sorts of works, the International Mission Board and all sorts of other agencies and in countries all over the world. So we wanted to take advantage of those contacts and get our students involved, the ones who are interested in doing that, in those, uh, in those locations. So we've had students, while they were undergraduates, shooting documentaries in Central America, in Brazil, in Calcutta, in the Ivory Coast, Doing, uh, in the Ivory Coast, they did two documentaries about AIDS. In Calcutta, they were doing a film about William Carey. And the producer-director got so sick that she had to go home. And so the Baylor intern directed and produced the show. And there's a, there's a freedom involved. In a university setting, there, there's a freedom of, of inquiry. I, I can ask the questions I'm interested in. I mean, no one... Uh, no one's going to get really upset. It may sound a little bit odd that, that I make films about missionaries and about automobile racing. But, but no one's going to tell me I can't do that. And, and I don't have to make a film to pay the rent or put groceries on the table. I'm, I make the films I'm interested in. I do the research that I think is, is interesting and challenging and and Baylor gives me the freedom to do that and then there are all these e excited people around all the time it's 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 a great combination we we have very very good students and they come from all over the world we have of course from the United States from Texas we have students from Zimbabwe we have students from Venezuela from Mexico from Australia uh, some of our best students come from uh, outside of the country. Well, I think they see that uh, 
Baylor will will give them, first of all, a first-rate education, and, and we hope that a lot of them will go back to their own countries and be leaders, and particularly leaders in helping their countries deal with the problem of environmental impact of fossil fuels, for example, in our case. Um, the, they, they get an a education in aviation sciences, for example, that enables them to, to deal with these problems. They understand the problems. They know the international ramifications of the imbalance in the world because of fossil fuels. Everything we deal with is a science, but the arts part of this is extremely important. For these students, uh, the worst thing to do is educate somebody in the sciences without a broad-based understanding of the humanities. Because, as I say, we're producing leaders, not just technocrats. So it, it, it definitely belongs in arts and sciences, no question about it. I, I just love to teach. Uh, if I had to make a choice between flying or teaching, it would be a terrible, terrible choice to make. But I guess I would have to come down on the side of teaching because it's what really makes my day. Well, to me, the, the thing that makes Baylor stand out, makes it special, is that in addition to providing a extremely good education, it provides a, a, a moral guidance for the students. Everybody, and it's not just Baylor that does that, but I think Baylor, Baylor is, uh, is, is very strong in that area. Uh, in our department, for example, we stress stewardship, but stewardship is simply a sense of responsibility to the earth and to the people in the earth. And, and that's really what an educated person should be doing. They should be taking advantage of that education and giving some back. And I believe that Baylor inculcates that, that sense of responsibility in students. Abner was speaking to the Circle K one time. And the Circle K kids wanted to do something worthwhile. And so I suggested to them that they, that they set up a table at registration uh, and uh, invite students to stop by and be admised, ad, advised about which teacher to take. <laughs> anywhere, any school you go to, anywhere, anytime, big ones and little ones. I went to the University of Wisconsin as a graduate student. Uh, and there weren't very many good teachers there in terms of percentages. You had to pick the teachers if you wanted a good one. And so if you come to Baylor or the University of Wisconsin, any place else, why a good student uh, ought to start inquiring which are the best teachers on the campus and take them. I didn't have the opportunity to take class with Ralph Lynn. I got to meet him once, and he was, he was gracious enough to, to sign his book that he wrote, um, the collection of columns that he's written over the years, and he uh, personalized with the autograph, which was a moment of, uh, of, of small fame for me, I think, because you hear so much about Ralph Lynn in the history department, and my grandfather claims that Ralph Lynn is one of those people that you just never forget. And he still comes in the history department once a week. He's, I think he's 91 or 92 now, and he still comes up to check his mail and, and try to keep up on the academic reading in the, in the, in the Chronicle of Higher Education or the, or the Journal of the AHA or whatever. He's, he's still alive and kicking. I mean, he's amazing. He's, he's, got, he's still sharp, too, which I think so. I hope I'm like that when I'm in my 90s. My number one uh, faculty member who I am her number one fan is Professor Ann Miller in the English department. She has been around quite some time and is a living legacy at this university. She has so much charisma and energy and love for her students. You walk into the class and you are mesmerized by what she will do to you and bring literature to life. And she demands that you do your work. It is not a class to slack in. It is not an easy A. You work hard, but you want to work hard to please her and, and to learn. She makes you excited to learn. And she is so personal behind the scenes in her room. You go into her office and she will take you out to dinner. She will bring you to her house. She's more hospitable and more friendly than most any person, much less a faculty member that I can think of. And that's just phenomenal to be able to walk into a faculty member's office at virtually any time and have them accessible and anxious to talk to you. I mean, they're really interested in the students' point of view, and they realize that's why they're here, is to teach us. And my father died last fall, and Dr. Daniel and Mrs. Vardaman were both there at the funeral supporting me, and I've just felt so much love and support from the faculty and staff. Well, I'm now a university scholars major. I didn't start out that way. I started out biology, but in coming to school, 
and seeing so much other stuff that I hadn't experienced in high school, I realized there was a lot more to education, at least, and to the world than just a biology education. And so I found out about this University Scholars Program, which allows you to sort of design your own course, lo course load and uh, allows you to pick and choose the courses you want to take that you think will best fit where you want to be. You know, in that I want to be pre-med, I took a lot of science classes, yes, because I had to, but I also took a lot of philosophy and English and history because I think all of that's really important in the medical field as well. And that scholars program has allowed me to do that, to take all of those, that broad range of courses. It's a special program in that they, you have to apply and be accepted and you have to maintain a certain GPA, so it is a challenging program. But if you can maintain that GPA and keep your grades up to a certain level, then you really have a good time with it. So I have thoroughly enjoyed, oh, 95% of all my classes because I do the research on the, the, the wonderful professors that there are, and I find the courses that I think would be interesting to me, and then I get to follow through with them. So there's never a course that I haven't had to have a full say-so and what I've gotten to take, and I've had quite a range. I took personal finance, which is a junior level, 3,000 level business class. Uh, that was in the business department, one of the primary ones. i taken 16 hours of acting in the theater department, and that would be acting one, two, three, four, as well as scenic elements. Um, I transferred in some acting credit as well from other institutes. I have taken Texas history in the history department. I have taken um, guitar and music theory out of the music building. Uh, I have taken so many English courses and I've taken Spanish 1, 2, 3, and 4. I've also taken the speech pathology building, sign language 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I'm currently in the communication building taking a journalism class as well as another writing class called writing for the popular market. So if, there, if it looks interesting to me, I sign up for it. I don't think that to be a Baptist or Christian university you have to be anti-intellectual or you have to necessarily be closed-minded and hard and fast and strict on, on certain things. I think that it's more in the spirit of the university to really say, you know, we want to we test this. If a, if a Christian university can, can stand up academically, athletically, uh, socially, in all the different areas of, of university life and make that crossover and say we are maintaining these roots, this Baptist heritage, this Christian identity, but we're going to make it 21st century too. And that's one of the amazing things about, about a Christian university is that it, it's able to evolve without losing its original identity. And it, it's a hard challenge, but I know that a lot of the professors are, are really making conscious efforts at doing that. There's, there's new programs in the philosophy department right now on the Institute of Faith and Learning that's trying to, to, to bridge that gap between our religious identity and our intellectual endeavors. And I, and I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a feasible goal, and I'm, I'm glad they're doing it. I think it's going to be good for the students and good for the university. Studying abroad, I think, is, if I had to put my finger on it, that's the single most transformative experience a, a college student can have. Not only do you um, go somewhere else and, and live in another culture and, and speak their language and accommodate yourself to their customs, but you're also mingling and in, in meeting people and studying with people who are completely different, from completely different cultural backgrounds, from, from different premises of, of how they look at life, whether that be religious or ethnic or um, ge merely geographic. It's, it's something that goes a lot farther than a classroom because when I was in the Netherlands, when I was studying abroad there for a semester, I had the opportunity to not only be in class with people from all over Europe and the world, at, at this university, but I also had the opportunity to, to spend time with them one-on-one -on -one in, 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 in a more informal or casual environment, which is where the real learning takes place. You can do as much book learning or, or, or studying as you, as you please, but that only goes so far. It's, it's when you get to cross that boundary and become one with the people. And I think the main thing I learned from that trip was that you have to speak other people's languages. And I'm not meaning uh, foreign languages necessarily or linguistics, although I think that's a big part of it, but you have to be able to relate to a single person on their level. Uh, and, that, and that takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of flexibility, but the relationship in the end, I think, is always better because you're giving, they're giving, but you're taking and they're taking to where you meet in the middle and no longer is it talking through a, 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 you know, a glass door or anything, you, you are seeing each other one-on-one, -on -one. and that's when the world, I think, gets a little better. It's when people start seeing each other as individuals. 
When I was studying abroad in Russia, a friend and I went to the Marinsky Ballet and we were sitting at Swan Lake and I turned around and four rows behind me, I recognized this man and I turned to my friend and I said, Tanya, doesn't that guy behind us look so familiar? And we went up to him and introduced ourselves and said, excuse me, sir, do you have anything to do with Baylor University? And he grinned and after being a little bit shocked, said yes. And sitting behind us was Dean Sternberg, the former Dean of Music here at Baylor University. And it just goes to show that Baylor's green and gold flings all over the world. I have studied abroad twice now. I spent one summer in Guanajuato, Mexico, and I spent one semester, another spring semester, in Perth, Australia. And it has been, oh, hands down, the most incredible experience in my college years because you are on your own. You grow up, uh, you grow fast, and you are, every moment you're being stimulated because everything is new. Filling up with gas is exciting. Going to the grocery store, uh, walking down the street on the left-hand side, it, it's, everything's exciting because every, every second something is new. As is our custom, each year we close our chamber singer concert with the blessed Son of God. We would like to invite the former members of chamber singers to come up and sing this selection with us. Thank mm -hmm. you. 